next speaker is, can you hear me now? It's Louis Ortiz from um, University of Pittsburgh, and the presentation title is MicroRNA in Mesenchymal Stem Cell Derived Exosomes Ameliorate Pulmonary Fibrosis. Thank you very much, and uh, just as uh, everyone else, a uh, mode of uh, uh, gratitude to Luca and the team for a bloody well done job. Um, so I, I got a, a charge today that um, uh, might be tough, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to be disciplined and, and, and stick to my time. And so th th there are three points that, that I want to, to convey in this one talk. One is that I welcome this questioning of different models and the need that they do represent biology that is applicable to the patients that you're taking care of on this clinic. So today's data will be based on, on a sub-analysis of, of what you see. This is a partial, I don't think this is clear, oh, I'm sorry, is, that is um, uh, completely updated, but is, is a cataloging of, of our patients. Now, the summary that, that I want to, or the point that I want to bring from here is that if you look at this pie, then occupational lung disease also takes place as a cause of pulmonary fibrosis. So this brings an, a, a notion that some of these exposures may also be an effective experimental tool to test this biology. And this has a corollary in the human being because when we reported a couple of years ago our experiences with lung transplantations in patients with uh, silica-induced lung disease, we show clearly that, at least in our hands, um, these patients do much worse than their counterpart of about 70 or 80 patients that we had transplanted um, um, as a control for IPF. Not only did they reject their lungs much earlier, but they died, died very significantly. So this is also an issue. Silica-induced lung disease is equally lethal, is not easily treatable, and is a fibrotic lung disease. So if you do take that into the lung and you analyze that, you can find a very significant number of targets. And what I'm trying to, to take from this particular slide of one of those patients that you see that is that a cell that has been referred uh, um, uh, not uh, frequently in these talks is, is the macrophage meaning as a cell that has a predominant uh, aspect on the fibrotic biology. Dean's work has already told us how, and, and going back to Khalil's work, how historically this is a very good source for activation of transforming growth factor beta, for the release of inflammatory peptides and so forth. So that was the first point that, that I have. The second aspect of the talk then refers to the strategy that we have taken um, to uh, sort of ameliorate these injuries. And, and that strategy has concentrated in the biology of a subgroup of cells that are located in bone marrow and that have the conformation of a mesenchymal cell. So in essence, you're using a, a fibroblast to treat fibrosis. And this is important for two reasons. In my view, it's important because it is one cell. So in, in bone marrow, MSCs had been located both to the endosteum where they have to take care of the, pr the preservation of the bone and at the same time work at a now very well-defined uh, hematopoietic stem cell niche where they interact with the macrophage to guarantee two things. A, that the hematopoietic stem cell be cell-renewed and Second, that it only exit under the specific conditions that uh, are important. So it is not that the hematopoietic itself is deciding when to exit bone marrow, it's the fact that through the macrophage, the MSE is instructing this particular subset of biology. So we have taken this as a working hypothesis and, and um, uh, very, very early on reported on bleomycin that these cells might have been useful. And the second aspect was that we thought that they would contribute by cell renewal and tissue incorporation and stuff like that. But the message very early was that it was a very sophisticated set of paracrine activities. That is the second point that I'm trying to convey. The third point then, in, in a very short uh, period of time, is that this paracrine effect is becoming extremely complex and will have 
aspects of it that are cell dependent and on others that are exported in a cell independent manner. I just brought this as a point of clarification to sort of address resource equivalencies because this is very important. Just like bleomycin, we need to make sure that the cells you're characterizing, the cells that you are uh, sort of investigating, ought to at least resemble because not a fibroblast line will, will, will be the same. And I don't have time to go over this, but believe me, this is important and is the tedious aspect of, of the research, but it's, it's the one that, that, in my view, will be fundamental. Then, at this point, I want to bring your attention to this. Being close partners in bone marrow, the point that this, this slide illustrates is the fact that when you label a cell like an MSC, you realize how immense this cell is and how many macrophages, which are among the largest cells in the body, can interact with at one particular time. So what I'm going to address in the next few slides is some of the cell-dependent activity of these MSCs in trying to instruct the macrophage as to how to, to obey. And in here, I am recapitulating work that uh, one of my former mentors, Darwin Prokop, published in 2006 regarding the, how these cells were so successful at secreting that now they are not just secreting peptides, but they're secreting organelles, in this case, mitochondria. And we took that, that work a little farther and started doing crude preparation. So the soups that these cells were releasing, and as you can see in electron microscopy, in, in crude preparations, you got all this very compound and confusing milieu, but there are a number of well-defined microvesicles, in this case, uh, approximately two to 300 microns, that appear to have what uh, is the equivalent of a piece of a mitochondria in it, and when you probe with some of the mitochondrial-specific proteins, that holds true. In other preparations, it goes even farther to try to show up that within these vesicles, you can actually find an entire mitochondria in association with an, uh, the vesicles or densities that appear to be related to uh, a, a lysosome, thinking, therefore, that they correspond to um, uh, an autophagosome. And what we reasoned was, which is demonstrated by the fact that some of those markers are, are uh, easily found in, in this particular vesicle. So what we reasoned was the fact that it was a specific mechanism for these cells to extrude their mitochondria. We threw up a, a genetic um, um, a approach in which you label the, the phagosome. Tell me, I, I was trying to to show a video as to, but I don't know if this is um, working, or, there you go, as to how, um, I don't know if this will project well, the character specifies the fact that within the, uh, the phagosome, the mitochondria is labeled, and subsequently then is moved to the periphery of the cell, where subsequently in bone marrow, then the macrophages will pick it up. This is important, and this is the argument that I had with, with um, Andreas before, which is that we need to understand what is the context of autophagy in, in the context of pulmonary fibrosis, because other than that, you <laughs> will... I'm sorry. Thank you, Dean. That is, is just the fact that I can't see the, the stuff from here. Don't start walking all over the place. All right. So, so what I was saying is, that, is the context in which this process of autophagy takes place. In the case of the MSC, what happens is, is that the, the, if you inhibit the autophagy, the cells die within minutes. I mean, it takes about 20 to 25 minutes in, in, on the plate. But the beauty of this biology is the fact that the MSCs, in a very, very close manner, interacts with the macrophages and, and in, in in that context, let's see if, if, if this one works. There you go. In that context, you will see that the macrophages very clearly survey, um, go ahead, it very clearly survey the, the, um, the MSC, and the MSC offers this cargo that now is effectively transferred to the macrophage and 
Consequently, then, the macrophage undergoes all kinds of, of very, very significant um, um, uh, changes. So go, go ahead and, and move it. Now, I, I got about 10 seconds then to, to go over the, the aspect of what are those changes in the macrophage. And just to, to make the talk um, 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 earlier, I was thinking of simply addressing the notion that consequently these vesicles are, are loaded with all kinds of goodies. The one that we had particularly studied with uh, the help of Naftali Kaminsky are a subset of microRNAs. This is a complex problem. I can tell you that it's not a willy-nilly situation where the cells are just going to pack that. We characterize initially five different donors, and much to our surprise, this is a very well-conserved uh, biology. In, in these different donors, the number of uh, microRNAs that were highly expressed in the microvesicles were highly conserved. They are rare moieties. Not many of them had been well characterized. I can tell you, and I'm going to skip over this, that uh, remember what Jack Elias was telling us earlier. Um, this process of the uptake of the microvesicle from, um, uh, the, uh, from the part of the macrophage is uh, biphasic. So there is an adherence of, of, of the, macro, the vesicle to the cell of the of macrophage that generates some lipidation, but subsequently they are incorporated. And once they are incorporated, then they elicit a clear sensing of the content of the microRNA. In this case, it's the Rick helicase MDA5. That, in turn, is followed, and I don't know if this is uh, projecting well, by the activation and the trans nuclear translocation of transcription factors such as NF-kappa-B. The summary of this is the macrophages suffer a profound activation. Uh, prostacyclin synthase 2 is one of the genes that you come along. But there are very serious aspects of, of um, uh, inflammation such as TNF and others. But the most important thing in our view is the fact that consistently what you observe is that all the innate response is dumped in terms of expression of the TLR, specifically TLR7, 9, and all the endosomal things. And the proof is in the, in the concept I'm going to, for, for issue of time, skip a lot of this data. This is a property that can be manipulated. In this case, we use um, uh, um, in vivo sensing or, or inhibition of or some of the key enzymes but, um, uh, that produce the microRNAs within the exosomes, and that blocks this activity. Interestingly, though, in vivo, what you find out is that there is the ability of these microvesicles to emulate very closely the activity that the intact cell has. I don't have time to go over all of this data, but um, just reproducing some of the earlier work you guys did with, with the Lysix monocyte that are then recruited into the lung indicating that they were subsequently the cells that instructed the polarization of the macrophage. And what I would like to show you here is just the histograms and how you characterize those cells that are defined according to Geisman by the CCR2 expression as the predominant inflammatory macrophages. In the normal lung, these cells are not very, very abundant. But in response to injury, they start to migrate into the lung very, very quickly. And very interestingly, collections of those cells are the productors of great deal of inflammatory and profibrotic mediators that all of you ha have addressed in this conference and how these exosomes or microvesicles do emulate the MSEs in inhibiting the activation and the recruitment of these cells in the lung. And that just simply correlate to the histology, the inflammatory activity in BAL, the expression of pertinent transcripts in the inflamed lung and stuff like that. I'm going to conclude here. I apologize if I exceeded my time. Um, I just want to take a second to A, acknowledge that I am deeply in debt to a very large number of individuals that have helped me on this, to my colleagues 
topics in study sections and so forth that had been first open-minded, secondly very, very um, gentle in, in, in opening our horizon, and, and, and then the institutes that had allowed uh, the funding of, of, of the research so that, that it can be conducted. Thank you very much. Once again, a lot of thanks to, to Luca. And, um, be happy yeah. to address Let me just ask you a question. So you, uh, you isolate these MSCs, squirt them into the lung, right? And the, um, the microvesicles then are released, the mac and they're regulating the macrophage. So is this only going to work for macrophage-mediated diseases? No. So, so that is a very important point. And, 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 and now I realize that I might have done a very mediocre job at, at, at um, actually addressing that. No, 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 no. It's, it's the simple fact that, um, A, within these models, you cannot address all the complex biology. But there are several posters in this presentation that address the interaction with epithelium. Um, the group in Colombia, for instance, um, uh, Jahar, had actually addressed very elegantly within a system of acute lung injury the interaction with both endothelium and, um, in his case, the mitochondrial transfer to alveolar epithelium. So, so no, they, 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 in, in essence, uh, the, the ability of these cells is to be uh, uh, in other words, they pluripotent. They have the ability to talk many, many languages in a concomitant manner, and importantly, to to some extent, sense the environment they are residing in. Look, that's a very interesting concept that you had with regard to the uptake of these exosomes by the by the macrophages. I mean, for a long time, people know that microRNA have been contained within exosomes. Um, but exactly what their roles were is not clear. Now, you see a lot of exosomes in the serum, for example. Do you know whether or not m monocytes uh, take, can, can engulf these within the serum? Because that may play an important role of regulating the immune response, to, not just in this case, but in things like cancer, for example. Yeah, I, I cannot address that question with data of our own. I, you know, I was educated in molecular biology on, on, on an RNA's inhibition type of thing. So I was very surprised when 10 years later they come and say, well, RNA floats freely in, in peripheral circulation. <clears throat> but there, there is a growing evidence. Uh, there is, the, for instance, the, the issue of the fibrocyte and stuff like that, that not just not only that, but, but actually protein that is attached or, or RNA that is attached to, to big proteins such as amyloid can actually intrude into cells when they are uptake. Mm. So, so I think the answer to your question is it, there is biologic credence to that. Thanks. So, Lu Luis, I, th yes. I, I think this is extremely exciting. I just want to point out that this is actually a very ancient mechanism which was, is, is conserved throughout evolution and it's involved in, in embryogenesis in, in epithelial mesenchymal interaction and this mm -hmm. was actually first described in the 1980s in the tooth germ, actually. Um, and, and so this, this, we completely agree with you that this is what stem cells are probably doing in complex tissues, is, is actually a very complex reset of the tissue milieu. And this is one of the very important mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And I congratulate you on having all, on, on all the details of it. And I think, actually, this is an approach that may work in this very complex and horrible disease that we've been talking about all week, where it is clearly not one thing happening and that these tissue interactions can reinterpret the milieu and actually fix it towards a more homeostatic, developmentally appropriate milieu. Yes, and that, that echoes Paul's, um, Paul's former question. And, and, and so in my view, what we ought to do is is identify reasonable targets, right? I mean, targets that if IE, epithelial cell biology, is owed to be important, I think that that's what ought to be target. I don't know if we're going to be able to kill fibroblasts using this. I can tell you that the approach we have done is that since they are endovascularly 
um, uh, secreted had taken a, um, uh, an issue with the development of vessel re, um, remodeling leading to overloading the right ventricle and using the right ventricular function as a surrogate mm -hmm. of the vasculature in the lung, in the fibrotic lung, and see if we can somehow modulate those particular aspects. Yeah, it, it's a way of manipulating complexity without going to a, a, an oversimplified solution. Thanks. <coughs> My question um, relates to the, are the, what, cell, what are these cells really? Monocytes, macrophages, um, you know, sort of where are they, uh, where are they in that spectrum? Um, but the, the question, I, the thing that was disturbing me was, if you look at the patients that we take care of, most of them, the macrophages are um, packed with cigarette particles, or particles from, or mm -hmm. dust, or whatever. I mean, one of the things that's characteristic is these are smokers. And I wonder, does that then make this normal mechanism, or potentially normal mechanism, completely dysfunctional? Is that, is that a role in what's going on? So, so two things to that effect. Mauricio's talk will address, to some extent, how these populations of cells might be actually deregulated in IPF. So two things, the, 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 the human being is loaded at birth with MSCs. And as a function of growth and aging, the number and the activity of the cells in bone marrow is decreasing. So that by the fifth decade, you probably had a fraction of what you came to, to the, on, in this earth. The second aspect goes to, again, the importance of understanding very clearly what is it that we're talking about. So an MSC is a cell that is as closely related to a fibroblast and is absolutely devoid of hematopoietic markers. So bone marrow transplantation biology taught us that MSC transplantation should not replenish the bone marrow or a lethally irradiated individual mouse or any other animal. And that is expressed by the fact that these cells do not have expression of any erythroid, myeloid, or endothelial uh, marker. And very interestingly, at least in our hands, you don't have a lot of activity. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you know, you, you, you. You, you should have done that yesterday. When, when I woke up this morning, I had this nightmare that um, I was dancing with Arnold Brody. Uh, 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 and I said, uh, this must be Dante's comedy or something. But, but that's the point. Uh, what is this last question? Yes, I, I think that you partially answered this, but I, I would like to focus on macrophages and your model of silica-induced fibrosis. You clearly show that these uh, exosomes or mesenchymal stem cells decrease the, the fibrotic response. I think so. That, and, uh, but these exosomes activate macrophages. I, I, I don't understand what the link between an activated macrophage and a decreased fibrotic response. Very good. So, so this goes back to this particular notion of whether inflammation is relevant to the resolution. So, so I, I, you, you remember 15 years ago, we started this biology with the notion that TNF, and I am been a TNF biologist all my life, is, is abnoxious, right? Well, it turned out that in the case of a particle, the macrophage substantially requires the activation of this pro-inflammatory activity to survive this injury. So if you can imagine that the only way that you have to resolve silicosis is to sequester the particle, somewhere in a lymph node or something like this, the macrophage has to be well gifted to that. So macrophages that substantially express TNF in response to silica survive effectively. They migrate well, they go to lymph nodes, and they express many less amount of inflammatory responses. So 
this, this data made justice to that question, and the process is biphasic. So it turned out that the picta of the vesicle has a short-legged but very effective activation of the macrophage in the short period of time. The microRNAs down the road appear to target and degrade. So what is not there is that when you now specify the microRNA, in this case, for instance, 451, which is an erythroid uh, fundamental microRNA that specifies the progression of the erythroid cell in bone marrow, then TNF starts subduing. If you then treat the macrophage before with silica, there is great deal of TNF. When you then introduce the microRNA, the TNF is decreased. And there are good targets of TNF in the hair pain uh, regions and so that you can, you, you can explain that biology. Thank you. I, I'm really sorry.